So, yeah, Akwaba. And Akwaba means welcome in a local Ghanaian dialect, Chi. So welcome to my presentation for today. In the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'll be taking you on a smooth trip or a smooth tour to my country, Ghana. So stick and stay tuned with me. To begin with, I'd like us to watch a short video. Just taking you, that will give you a glimpse of here what Ghana yeah. actually looks like. Okay. Yeah, so let's just take some few minutes to learn about Ghana, fact that everyone has to know before leaving this place. So Ghana is a country in West in Africa, located specifically in the West Africa region, with, a, with its capital city known as Accra. In the past, Ghana had 10 regions, but then in December 2018, there was a referendum held to add six more regions to the country. So I mean, after the referendum, we ended up having 16 regions. So Ghana presently has 16 regions and each of these regions have their respective capitals. Right here is a map of Ghana showing all the 16 regions in Ghana. Presently, Ghana is home to about 31,072,940 people. And there are over 70 ethnic groups in Ghana with the Akan group being the largest ethnic group. The official language spoken in the country is English, and this is because we're colonized by the British. However, there exist over 50 indigenous languages which are spoken, but then the language that is widely spoken in Ghana is Tree. So Tree is a dialect of the Ashanti people of the largest um, ethnic group in Ghana, which is the Akan group. So Ghana as Sub-Saharan's firstborn. Ghana was formerly called the Gold Coast. And this is because when the Europeans first arrived in Ghana, they discovered that Ghana was, or the Gold Coast, was a region filled with a lot of gold. We're rich in gold. So, I mean, it was just prudent for them to name the region the Gold Coast. Now, after the Europeans left, there was an invasion of Ghana by the British. So over time, Ghana became a British colony. So in the year 1874, Ghana became a formal British colony up until Sith March where we actually we, we gained independence and this fine gentleman right here is called Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He's the one who led Ghana to attain independence in the year 1957. He was the prime minister at that time. So for Ghana the month of March is like a month of, uh, sorry, a month of independence. So all through March it's Ghana month because we, we attain independence in the month of March. Yeah, after attaining independence, Ghana went on to become a republic on the 1st of July, 1960. But then when we gained independence, we didn't have a president. It was still the prime minister who was at the helm of affairs. So when we became a republic, that is when we first had our president. And it was the same man who led us to attain independence, who became the first president of Ghana. Beside him, you see, our, that's, so this is our flag. The colors are red, gold, green, and the black star. And the colors have their meaning. So the red signifies or symbolizes the struggle, the blood that was shed in the struggle for independence for the country. Gold signifies the mineral resources we have, how rich we are in mineral resources. Green also signifies, I mean, our rich forestry. And finally, the black star is the, it's the, um, the load star of African freedom. Now, I say Ghana is Sub-Sahara's firstborn because we were the first country in Sub-Sahara Africa to gain independence from our colonial masters. 
And as a Ghanaian or as a proud Ghanaian, I can confidently say that not only were we the first to liberate ourselves from colonial rule, but then we set the pace for the rest of Africa and beyond. That is why Ghana is sub-Sahara's firstborn. Now, having said all these, I'm going to show you another video that's going to sum up our history and then our walk to independence. So enjoy this video as well. When the first Europeans arrived, getting to the end of the 15th century, they found so much gold. That is why it was named the Gold Coast. It was also the time of the discoveries, the great explorations. So as the Gold Coast was discovered, then you go to the Americas were also discovered. And they wanted to have plantations grow cotton, grow tobacco, grow sugar cane, and they discovered that the Africans they came to meet were very strong. So the Gold Coast became more or less like a slave coast. Ancient forts recall the latter centuries, an era of traders from Europe, a time of gold and slavery, a time of darkness. Emilia Castle was built in 1482 by the Portuguese to protect what they had discovered. It was the first fortification that was built for the trade. So along the coast were dotted quite a number of these fortifications where slaves were kept and shipped off to the Americas. second past midnight, March the 6th, 1957. The moment has come. Here in West Africa, a nation is born. Ghana is free. Ghana was the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to gain independence, and it was great news for Ghana and the rest of Africa. Fortunately, we had a leader, Kwame Nkrumah, who had experienced a bit of racism in the Americas, who had lived in Britain before, and so who was quite passionate about the rights of Ghanaians to take care of themselves. He said, we prefer independence with danger than servitude in tranquility. Okay, so from the video that we have seen just now and from the earlier videos, we can tell that Ghana has come a long way since independence. And one thing we are very proud of as Ghanaians is our democracy, which is exemplary to many countries in Africa. I'll say that our journey to democracy hasn't been the smoothest. It hasn't been um, smooth sailing. But then, and this is because, I said this because Ghana has experienced at least seven coup d'etats in the country prior to becoming a democracy. But then, thankfully, um, <clears throat> sorry, thankfully, all these um, coup d'etats came to a halt in 1992 when Ghana became a fourth republic. So Ghana transitioned into a democracy in 1992 through a referendum that was held in 1991. Presently, Ghana is a multi-party state and we have a centralized system of government. I always boast in, oh, I always boast in our democracy, I always boast about our democracy. So I'd say that and much democracy at the moment is, is going to be three decades old in 2022, a significant milestone for my country. And I'd say that this democracy we have has accounted for the stable political and socioeconomic climates we presently enjoy in Ghana. So right here, this artwork is, we call it, we call this artwork a coat of arms. It's, it's one of our national symbols, yeah. Okay, going on to talk about natural resources. So undeniably and undoubtedly, Ghana is one of the countries in Africa 
that is very rich in resources. So one of the one of the vital resources in Ghana is arable land. Therefore, agriculture has been a significant contributor to the Ghanaian economy. In the year 2020, agriculture actually accounted for 28.46% of total employment in Ghana. This shows how vital agriculture is and arable land as a resource is to my country. Moving on to cocoa. Cocoa is one of the things we boast about having in Ghana. I'm not going to lie here. It's one of our resources we take, we take pride in. So it's a notable resource we have. Statistics indicate that, I mean, presently, Ghana is the second largest producer of cocoa globally after Ivory Coast. And after Ivory Coast, and we export to a lot of countries across the world. Cocoa has always been the backbone of the Ghanaian economy. You cannot mention the Ghanaian economy or growth in the Ghanaian economy without mentioning cocoa. And cocoa presently sustains the livelihood of over 700,000 farmers in the southern belt of Ghana. Talk about gold. I mean, Ghana, we have we literally have everything. <laughs> but then, yes, gold is also one of the resources. Once again, we boast in having. In the year 2019, Ghana of seated South Africa to become the largest producer of gold in Africa. And this resource we have has attracted so many multinational firms, such as Newman Gold Co, Newman Gold Co, rather, sorry, and Anglo Gold Ashanti to act to invest in Ghana and in the Ghanaian economy at large. This is not to say that gold is the only mineral resource we have. We have diamond, we have bauxite, and other minerals mined in the, in the country. Back to, sorry, back to talking about resources. I highlighted these, these three main ones because I mean, they are significant contributors to the Ghanaian economy, but then we have other resources that exist aside these three. But for the purpose of this presentation, I chose to highlight um, gold, I chose to highlight cocoa, I chose to highlight arable land as uh, vital resources. Talk about tourism. Yes, I'd say Ghana is your one-stop destination to go to when you come to Africa. Look no further. Ghana is the place to go to. <laughs> so Ghana symbolizes Africa as a tourist destination. And I can boldly say that tourism began on our coast. Why do I say this? Prior to colonialism, our slave masters came to our coast for adventures. They just came to see what was in there, you know. But then after they came and they discovered Ghana, they discovered a gold coast. They were like, okay, we can actually capitalize on what these people have and then make it ours, you know. That's what led to, I mean, the whole colonialism. But then colonialism actually started as an adventure and it started in the coast of Ghana. So I would always say that tourism began, tourism in Africa actually began in our coast, non negotiable. Yes. Aside, um, uh, yes, and I can move on to say that, I'm moving on to say that Ghana is filled, as part of our tourism, Ghana is filled with diverse wildlife. The elephants are just, I chose this elephant because I mean, okay, they're actually part, but in our first video, we see that there are other wildlife that, is, that exist in Ghana. So we have diverse wildlife. We have numerous historical sites, such as the Elmina Castle that the, the lady present spoke about in the video. We have other, hill reserves, we have what, a lot of waterfalls actually exist in Ghana. We have so many historical sites and I mean, Ghana's culture is very beautiful. It's one of the finest you can find in the world. Let me say so, let me use the world. And also we have world-class hotels in Ghana as well. Now I'll talk about our effective transportation system. Ghana has one of the best transportation systems you can find in Africa. And this has actually accounted for the inflow of tourists to the country. Talk about destination Ghana, talk about tourism again. In the year 2019, Ghana had one of the major, one of its major tourist activities, which was dubbed the year of return. And what this pair the definition I put here is the year of return was a major landmark, spiritual and birthright journey, inviting global African families home and abroad to mark 400 years of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in Jamestown, Virginia. In this, in the background, you see uh, that's the Elmina Castle, and this castle actually has a facilitated slave, slave trade in years past. So that's the Elmina Castle we have right here. What did the year of return do? What did having the year of return do for Ghana in the area of tourism? So the year of return actually opened up Ghana to the rest of the world as one of the 
one of the tourist, one of the main tourist destinations in Africa. That is what the year of attended for us. It was, it was actually, it was very big. It was very, it was a, it was a very big event. And like I mentioned earlier, it opened up Ghana to the rest of the world. Yeah. Now talk about the tourism industry again. The tourism industry has contributed significantly to the Ghanaian economy, and it is one of the fastest. It's one of the fastest growing industries in Ghana. In the year 2016, tourism was the fourth largest foreign exchange earner in the country. Yeah. So um, having said all these and having presented, um, I mean, these a few things about my country, I can boldly say that Ghana is shaping the Africa rising narrative. And this video I'm about to show you once again sums up the diverse ways in which Ghana is shaping the Africa rising narrative. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed watching it. Ghana, a state political environment within the West African sub-region with established democratic institutions and systems to ensure good governance in the country. Strategically located in the center of the world, with easy access to EU, US, South America, Asia, African markets. Temaport, a developed seaport with duty-free imports on manufacturing equipment. With an ongoing renovation and expansion, the port is aiming to transform into the largest shipping hub for West Africa. A world-class airport designed to meet the latest International Air Transport Association requirements. Ghana has international standard logistics infrastructure to local, regional, and global companies. With modern road infrastructure, given easy access to West African market of over 370 million population. Over 60% arable land and 336,000 irrigable land available for commercial farming, presenting opportunities in agro-processing. Producing oil in commercial quantities since 2010 and the introduction of more sustainable sources of power significantly increase the country's energy sources. With a mobile penetration rate of 79.94% and voice penetration of 132.44%, the highest number of fiber optic points in the West African sub-region and the fintech industry worth over $32.49 billion, Ghana's ICT sectors ensures the highest quality of global connectivity. Ghana's growing consumer market is providing compelling reasons to invest in the services sector. Modernized healthcare, which is second in Africa and fourth in the World Health Governance Capacity Index. Ghana is committed to its education development with the aim of producing a well-educated workforce. The country is focused on housing and infrastructure with existing demand of over 2 million units nationwide. With a robust ecosystem of fast-growing banks, non banking financial institutions and a well-established stock exchange. Ghana is known for diverse wildlife, colorful culture, numerous world heritage sites and world-class hotels, which makes the country one of Africa's favorite tourist destinations. The government of Ghana, through the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, is committed to driving investment reforms to improve the ease of doing business for both local and foreign investors. Welcome to limitless possibilities in a steadily advancing and dynamic economy. Okay, so to conclude, um, I mean, I haven't seen all these videos and I haven't said all these amazing stuff about my country. When you think about Ghana, my beloved country, I'd like for you to think about Ghana as a viable investment destination a world-class tourist destination, and above everything, your gateway to Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Open it up for questions, so feel free to either use the chat or unmute yourself. Natasha, feel free to ask your question.
Um, I wasn't going to ask it. I was just uploading the stuff for her uh, brilliant com uh, presentation. So there was not a question, but maybe a congratulations. Is that what I... <laughs> Anyone else? I'll ask a question if that's okay. That's okay. That's, um, so thank you, that was great. Um, I wanted to, I guess I'm curious in terms of the region um, because Ghana is, um, as you said, is in many ways a beacon of democracy even though it's not been always um, straightforward. Mm -hmm. But you have several other countries that border um, Ghana that have had their own share of, of, of struggles. Does that impact, impact Ghana in any way when, you're, uh, when the countries you're surrounded by um, are struggling? Um, for now, I would say yes, because, I mean, it just takes me back to something I learned this semester. If you're independent and your neighbors are suffering, that definitely makes you a bad neighbor, you know, and definitely... When you look at the area of trade, when you look, when you look especially at the area of trade, we can't do it our neighbors at some point. So definitely, if there are any challenges faced by our neighbors, automatically we are affected by anything bad that happens to our neighbors because we rely on each other to facilitate trade, to facilitate other activities. So yes, if countries surrounding us have a challenge, of course, we in some way would also bear those challenges or face the, I mean, the consequences of those challenges as well. Thank you. I had a question about the languages. You, you mentioned English is the official language, but there are about 50 mm -hmm. indigenous languages. How are those usually taught or passed on? Is it really kind of uh, based on family doing the effort to pass on the language or uh, within the community are there schools where the children would learn how does that usually work with the language acquisition yeah for the language acquisition there are some particular languages that are taught in schools in high schools so aside your family aside your society where you grew up and the language they speak you learn the local languages in schools and it actually differs from region to region so for instance the region that i grew up i grew up in the northern part of ghana i actually studied Dagbani, although it's a dialect that's spoken there. That's what I studied and actually took an exam for. But someone in the South, let's say for the Ashanti region like Kumase, where they speak Chi, that is the language that is going to be taught there. So it varies from region to region, yeah. And socialization also helps, you know. We pick languages when we move from one region to the other or even just having neighbors who speak a dialect different from yours helps in you learning what they speak as well. So that's how it's transferred. Hi, Amatha. Hi, Charlie. Um, question. Um, great presentation and congratulations on um, your independence. I hope you're doing something fun this whole month. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Um, my question, I think you mentioned something about the 700,000 jobs. Um, and as you know, we're in almost some of the same classes and the cocoa industry is, you know, considered and categorized as like a wicked problem. Violations. So the 700,000 jobs, how does this translate in terms of human rights violations? Like what is the Ghanaian um, government doing about that and how are they protecting their people? Yes, yeah, so, so as much as possible, I'll, I'll go back to before the government works with any farmer or before any, I mean, firm works with these farmers, like we, like we learned in our classes, the firms have their set, their regulations they have already set up. So for some firms, once you violate those regulations, we don't work with you in the first place. I mean, I'm not going to say that the issue of child labor in the cocoa industry is something that is unheard of or not seen in Ghana. It's definitely there. But as much as possible, these firms and the government try to make sure that all the farmers they work with are compliant to the set standards. That's what happens. It's as simple as that. You comply or we deal with you, basically that. Yeah, so, I mean, child labor, I know you're talking about the issue of child labor in these farms and everything. It's one that is still an issue. But then I would say that the country has made significant progress in making sure that it's reduced to the bare minimum. Yeah. 
We have a question from the chat from Felix um, said impressive trajectory in the area over the last two decades. Um, in terms of the next decade, are the prospects for Ghana and what will be the drivers of growth? Can you come again? So you can also look in the chat. So basically, mm -hmm. what would be the next drivers of economic growth uh, for hmm. Ghana? For Ghana, with what I presented, I would still say that, yes, these these main areas, when you talk about agriculture, when you talk about what's called the exploitation of resources, tourism is still going to be a huge driver in the economy of Ghana. But then I feel that as we advance, right, as we go ahead, there's going to be a lot of diversification in the economy. So for now, since I'm not an economic expert, I cannot point exactly which which area would drive growth in Ghana, but I can still, I still foresee these key areas being the main drivers of economic growth in the country. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I think with that, we wanna thank you so much for taking the time to share with us a little bit about visit you there or family. I hope you come. <laughs> thank you again. And like I mentioned, we will be posting this presentation on the YouTube website uh, for the School of International Affairs. So you're more than welcome to access it afterwards. Thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mepha. Bye.